Awesome. And how did you come about joining the family business? <laughs> um, so after school and university, um, we uh, I returned to the farm just to uh, looking at various opportunities and actually just started packing co coffee with my um, parents, my, my grandparents. Good evening. Welcome to the Private Property Farming Podcast. My name is Mbali Nwoko, your host every Tuesdays and Thursdays um, right here on the Private Property uh, channel. So I'm not sure where you're watching us from, whether it's Facebook, YouTube, Instagram Live, uh, but thank you so much for following our channel. Thank you so much for subscribing to our YouTube channel as well and liking all the podcast shows that we've recorded and aired so far. Today we're sitting on episode 118 and we have Dylan Cummers, Cummings, who is one of the directors and um, uh, members within the family who run the Beaver Creek Coffee Estate. And our topic for this evening is called uh, the business of coffee. So if you're a coffee lover and... Um, don't pretty not sure how the coffee process works. I think this conversation might be the one for you and just understanding the farming or the business around coffee and how you get to enjoy your cup of coffee every single morning. Um, so if you have any questions for Dylan, uh, please feel free to comment, like, uh, and also share this video to anybody who you might think uh, could find our conversation this evening uh, interesting. And so, yeah, let's get straight into it. Dylan, thank Thank you so much for joining the podcast. How are you doing? No, very well. Thank you for having me, Mbala. It's, it's a pleasure. So Beaver Creek Coffee Estate, you said it's a family business. Tell us more about it. So the family uh, business started in the early 80s um, by my father, my parents and grandparents uh, mm. when they originally uh, bought a banana farm and then slowly converted to coffee. Um, mm. At that time, there was quite a lot of coffee being grown in South Africa. Also, joining the family business. <laughs> um, so after school and university, um, we uh, I returned to the farm just to uh, looking at various opportunities and actually just started packing co coffee with my um, parents, my, my grandparents. Um, it was kind of a, quite a small business at the time. Um, my my younger brother, Robbie, had joined the family business um, a year before me, and he was looking after the farm. And over those years, our family had built this uh, coffee business um, to include um, not only a, whole, a very strong wholesale business, but also ca two cafes. Um, mm. And we're working on various projects um, in the coffee space. Right. So does, does, is Beaver Creek involved in the entire uh, value chain around producing coffee? So farming, chicory, processing it, and then obviously selling your own brand of coffee. Um, um, and, and obviously now you're at, at wholesale level. So are you guys involved in every process of the value chain? Yes, so we're quite a unique business in that we are fully vertically integrated. So okay. uh, we're not only growers of coffee, um, we are also uh, processors and we also roast, which is typically done hmm. kind of a, as a separate entity. We have our own cafes and like I said, we also wholesale to both the hospitality industry and also mm. to retail. So it was, mm. it was quite one of the early decisions by my father and grandfather. Um, at the time, we were actually part of an association called the Natal Coffee Growers Association. And what my father and grandfather saw was the opportunity of the value addition. Um, of roasting. So yes. um, early on in the business, in the early 90s, we had moved from being solely a, 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 a grower to actually a roaster and starting to um, to be to sell coffee to coffee shops or restaurants. And uh, that's kind of where, where a lot of those farms in the 80s have closed down um, mm. and, and that whole industry kind of collapsed. Uh, we, we kind of survived that period because of the fact that we had the value addition of roasting. Right. So just for a point of clarity, right, um, you get the primary production, which is farming the actual 
coffee. And then the roasting part, is that the post-harvest um, leg of the farming? So there's actually, in, in, tradi in a traditional value chain in coffee, you would have the grower, um, which yes. would you know, be looking after the coffee trees, and then they would harvest the fruit. So it's a red ripe berry that is harvested. And then in, in, a, in the traditional um, post-harvest processing, it's really divided into, say, three kind of um, stages or, or operations. One would be the wet milling, uh, often referred to as a washing station or wet mill, which would handle the, the coffee cherry. Uh, it would remove the skin, the fruit part of it, separating the two coffee seeds. Would, there would be some uh, further processing of fermentation, washing, and then drying. Mm -hmm. This this dried coffee would then move from the wet mill to what is referred to as a dry mill, where they would do the final processing, which may uh, include on, or, um, dry, further drying if necessary, but would really involve the removal of the final two layers um, before you get down to the raw coffee, um, which would be hulling. And then there would be some sort of grading, um, either by size, color, uh, density, to a final raw coffee, which is often in the trade called green coffee. This would then, again, traditionally put into a 60 or 70 kilogram Hessian sack, which will then be shipped um, in containers to a, um, to a country of consumption, roasted, mm. then we, we would arrive at the roastery and then would be roasted, packed and then sold. So that's a traditional um, pros, uh, kind of value chain in coffee. What makes mm. us unique um, is the fact that all those processes are all in one location. And we not wow. only grow our coffee, we also work with other growers in our country. And we also okay. process for other growers in the country and do the roasting. Oh, wow. So, you know, like you said, you decided to uh, pursue the whole, the entire value chain of coffee growing. Didn't the option to be a grower for a large multinational, uh, I don't want to mention names, but um, uh, didn't the, the, the opportunity seem more lucrative for, for um, Beaver Creek, maybe just to be the grower and then you sell the coffee to um, you know, a more larger, more established uh, uh, company that, that deals with coffee? So, you know, uh, the... Over the last 20 years, the market for coffee has, has changed a lot. Um, mm. So, you know, especially in South Africa, where we are predominantly an instant coffee consuming country, there has been a shift to the, to the roast and ground uh, market, which is okay. kind of the filter coffee, the espresso coffee, the, the whole bean market, uh, sometimes referred to as. So um, the, the value, the, 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 the raw material cost in the world market is, even though it's, it's recently uh, you know, got quite high, historically it's very low price. And that mm -hmm. extra roasting aspect of the process adds a lot of value to the final product. And then selling directly to the consumer further kind of gives you that um, increase in value that you, you, that you can get from the product. And I would say actually in, in, up until uh, we've introduced our new model, um, you know, farming coffee in South Africa hasn't been viable. Um, because mm. of the the raw material uh, having such a low cost, so whereas potentially lining up with a um, with a big multinational selling raw material where they would do the value addition, I think at our scale and and kind of what our aspirations are, we think that extra value addition is far more beneficial uh, to participate in that final <clears throat> that final bit of the the the, um, the processing or final the final bit of the value chain. Yeah. Under what brand are you selling your coffee, uh, Dylan? Uh, because, you know, typically we think of Starbucks, you know, they would come into the country and have taken over the, the coffee market in South Africa. So under what brand are you selling and, and, and where could people find your coffee? So we, we uh, under the brand name Beaver Creek, it's the name of our farm. Okay. Um, and we also uh, have a second brand called Redberry. Uh, Redberry. Okay. Um, Beaver Creek. Uh, we, we sell it direct uh, online through our website. Um, we also have a fair amount of retail. Um, so we so we supply a few spas and pick and pays. Uh, pick and pays. Um, we are looking to expand this uh, part of our, our market. We also supply a lot to the hospitality industry. So we 
we supply the likes of Spur uh, within KZN. We've been recently working with them and uh, we're looking to expand that, uh, that uh, partnership. Uh, we work uh, with a number of independent coffee shops, restaurants, hotels, B&Bs. Um, so we, we've got quite a bit of uh, 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 places that we sell our coffee to. Um, and then we are also uh, working with the export markets, um, specifically around the Red Berry brand. Uh, where we, the Red Berry brand is slightly different to Beaver Creek in that we are working with other growers mm. and we are selling other growers coffee um, and that we, we, we are looking to develop the international market for that because there's a, there's a growing demand for high quality, unique coffees um, around the globe. Right. So now, am I, am I correct in saying you're actually selling the raw product? Um, uh, you know, obviously, uh, distributing it through to retail, hospitality industry, and some other coffee shops. So I could be buying coffee at my local coffee shop, but it could actually be coffee that's grown by Beaver Creek. Is that correct? <laughs> yes. So, so awesome. we, yeah, we sell it, we sell it uh, uh, in various forms. But uh, yes, it's, uh, we, we do both import as we import and we grow our own. So we do a combination of both. And that's why yeah. we, we've kind of made the strategic decision to start to um, spend more time promoting coffee farming in South Africa because we think it's mm. actually a, a viable um, pursuit with this new model we, we've been working on and um, where we, we offer the farmer the integration into the value chain. Um, so we, we're spending a lot, of, a lot of time developing that part of our business because we, we want to eventually within the next 10 years be 100% South African coffee. Yeah. So let's just talk about the opportunities that exist within the business of farming coffee. Um, you mentioned that there's not a lot of uh, coffee farmers in South Africa. Why is that? Is it, the, is it because of climate change? Is it because of high input costs? Um, is, is, is maybe South Africa even suitable for growing coffee at this stage? So, you know, though, though historically coffee, coffee has been grown pretty widely in South Africa, um, there never was a suitability study done. Um, so other than kind of farmer's experience, you know, there wasn't any, any kind of um, climate study done. So we, we, we took the last year to final, do a suitability study, which we took um, some research which was done in 2015 and we uh, looked at South Africa. And we've, we, we actually took it a little bit further and took out in all the residential areas or the environmentally sensitive areas and, and also looked at slope. And we actually have found 750,000 hectares that are, is suitable for coffee in South Africa. Um, so th there's a high level of suitability. And in, mm. in a lot of the areas that are suitable are those areas that are, the, the land is actually underutilized. Um, so we, we, there's, there's high levels of suitability. Historically, I think it's two factors. One is the fact that um, South Africa has predominantly been an uh, instant coffee consuming country. So the, the higher value roast and ground market hasn't been there. But as I've been discussing, that has really changed over the last couple of years with like yeah. you know, institutions like Wimpy and Mug and Bean really promoting the consumption of pure coffee. And more recently, the likes of Seattle, Vida and, and Starbucks, yeah. like you mentioned. Um, and then the second thing is the... Um, you know, there's a perception that coffee can only grow, be grown at altitude on a mountain somewhere. And this is really a myth. And mm. this is kind of what we've proven with our suitability study. So a combination of not having a strong domestic market and um, misunderstanding around suitability, I think that's an, not allowed the industry to kind of prosper. Um, and that's what we're trying to change. Um, and we believe it's actually a high value crop. Uh, mm. that coffee is. Yeah. And how easy or difficult is it to break into the markets, especially around, um, you know, the wholesale industry, the retail space, um, as well as um, the hospitality industry? Um, you know, are there more dominant big players or are there uh, opportunities for new entrants to obviously penetrate the market? I, th I think, um, you know, like any market, there is uh, barriers to entry. Um, I think for us, the most important thing has always been understanding what it takes to make a high-quality uh, cup of coffee. So yeah. if you understand how to make a, a high-quality cup of coffee outside of your own establishment and someone else's, 
um, you, you, you really help your customer, uh, you know, uh, produce something that their customers will come back and, uh, for. Um, and that's kind of the relationship that we've built with our customers is understanding what it takes, not only in the, on the farm level, in the post harvest processing, include roasting, but also within the establishment, um, you know, how to produce a quality cup, cup of coffee that a consumer will, will go out, out his way or her way to, to consume. Um, so I, th I think the, the market, the number of roasters in the country has really exploded um, over the last 10 years. Um, it's uh, quite phenomenal how many new entrants have been in the market. Um, but where the opportunity of new entrants I see um, is really around the growing side. Um, oh. I, th I think there's a big opportunity for more growers in the country. Um, and not necessarily only for the domestic market, but also for the international market. Uh, the world consume somewhere in the region of 10 million tons a year and there's a slight surplus in that in the world at the moment mm -hmm. but the forecast within the next 10 years is to reach 12 million tons so there's mm -hmm. an extra 2 million tons of coffee that the world uh, the, the, the the forecasts are for and like you mentioned you know with climate change areas around the world are you know um, reducing for for coffee production so mm -hmm. you know we see that there's a big opportunity in South Africa to meet that demand and and um, produce and and to produce a high quality coffee at that. Yeah, and even from a production perspective, what are some of the opportunities that exist around uh, the South African context? And um, like, where are the best provinces to farm the coffee? Um, you know, especially provinces that are maybe are underutilized um, and could be ideal for coffee for 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 coffee growers. And also, just what type of certification does one need? to start roasting, especially for any coffee uh, growers that are currently producing at the stage and maybe want to take it a leg to take their business uh, much further and go into roasting. So what are some of the um, certifications um, or compliance aspects that are required around roasting? So in, in terms of, uh, you know, the suitability in South Africa, it, it, um, and these are quite bro broadly speaking, but it's, the coastal belt of the Eastern Cape, um, as almost as far south as East London, uh, the okay. KwaZulu Natal coastline, um, probably depending on uh, exactly where you are, can be uh, up to 60 kilometers inland. Um, okay. And then further north in, in, uh, in Pumalanga, around the Sabi Valley, Hazy View areas, um, even in Barberton area, there's, there's suitability there. Um, and then uh, even far uh, uh, north in the Limpopo, around Zanin and Louis Trichard, um, oh, there's some suitability oh. in those areas. Um, and that's kind of, again, there's different zones within that area with different risks. But mm. uh, generally speaking, that's where uh, coffee can be grown. Um, yeah. So with, with coffee roasting, um, you know, we, we, the, there's no real certification uh, that one requires. Um, you can simply buy a roaster and, and, you know, this is happening at a, has been happening, like I say, over the last 10 years, you know, buying a small roast and putting it in your garage and buying coffee and roasting it and putting it in a packet and selling it. So there's, there's no real certification, but mm. with growers, we, we you know, we, we know the difficulties of being a vertically integrated business. Um, and what we, we promoting is that, um, that the farmer focuses on farming because mm. you know there's only so many hours in a day and only so much you can do so mm. the model that we've been working on is that we for our growers and we're working with about 22 growers now within all those regions in south africa is that wow. we do the post harvest processing um, and we do it at a very low cost and the mm. idea being is that by by, by enabling uh, integration into these value chains with the growers it will incentivize them to grow more plant more coffee um, and invest in the in the coffee sector. Um, so, and and it's I, I wouldn't recommend it, but um, uh, to roast as a grower because of the challenges of just farming and then processing, mm. they're, they're very big challenges. Um, but it is on the other end if you want to have a very small kind of operation, um, you know, where you just you it's the barrier to entry to roast is not that difficult, though like anything. Um, there's always a risk attached to all these things. 
Absolutely, absolutely. Just maybe mention some of the challenges that you've that you've experienced with working with some of the growers. You mentioned you have 22 growers in various regions. I know um, the farming industry is uh, extremely under pressure right now with high prices of fertilizers and fuel costs. So what are some of the challenges as a roaster as well uh, that you've experienced working directly with some of the growers? Yes, yeah, so I, th I think, you know, so we initially we were really just promoting coffee farming. So we weren't really yes. necessarily prescribing a specific way. But what we found is that certain practices, best practices that are quite well known in the industry weren't followed because mm. you know, fa farmers were th thinking, well, you know, this is similar to other crops we've grown. So mm. what we've moved towards is a much higher level of prescribed farming. So okay. we, we um, are prescribing a specific um, cultivar or species of coffee. And we actually sourced a, n a local uh, nursery that can produce a high quality seedling at a very low cost to make it mm. easier for the farmers to, um, to invest in coffee without having to build their own nurseries or ha um, have some poor practices in the nursery that will end in um, poor quality seedlings in the ground. Um, mm. We're prescribing uh, spacing, uh, which will come down to population density, um, irrigation systems, because we found that though a lot of the farmers could farm they were just not necessarily following best practice. And, and we really uh, went to the Brazilians. So we were working with um, some agronomists in Brazil um, wow. that, that really, you know, one, one thing that Brazilians have re really got right is around yield per hectare. Um, and we've looked at the Brazilian way to bring that here to get those high yields per hectare, um, sustainable mm -hmm. yields uh, that... Um, that the farmers can really make uh, create this high value crop because there's one thing of getting a high value um, like your um, price per ton or price per kilogram. There's one thing in achieving a high price for that, but being farming, it always is important to be uh, come down to a hectare. And if you're not having the right yields per hectare, then um, you you can doesn't matter how much money you're getting it, it still might not be profitable because you're not just getting the right yields. So yeah. we've kind of trying to mitigate the risk of the grower by focusing on these um, kind of best practices and be able to um, facilitate that for the, for the growers. Um, and that's what we, we're moving uh, closer into. Um, in, in the, in the post-harvest processing, there's, there's so many challenges in, in the post-harvest processing, uh, which we can mm -hmm. include roasting here. It's always down to the detail um, and, and the experience of that. And, and one, one of the big projects that I'm working on is to develop a super factory. So having spent 20 years in the industry, we, I realized that I realized that post-harvest processing is probably the, the, the weakest link in the value chain uh, okay. in coffee, and this is across the whole globe. So we've developed a super factory concept where um, we are uh, not only very efficient, but produce a much higher quality coffee, um, not by like a couple of bags, but by the container load. Um, and th this is part of, you know, the, the, the model that we're working on to facilitate the growers um, to make it very cost efficient that, again, like I say, we can, we can offer a farm gate price that is more valuable than someone, to, uh, someone who's going to uh, process and roast their own coffee on the farm. Um, so th there's, there's a lot of challenges in it. That's what we're trying to alleviate with the growers is to try and mitigate the risk and reduce those, uh, those risks. Yeah, I think that coffee is once uh, uh, space in the industry that's definitely overlooked. And like you said, there's not a lot of us in the in, in, in uh, us being farmers in, in in the coffee space. And I'm glad that you're quite um, you know excited and. Um, have high hopes rather with regards to the coffee industry in South Africa. And I think, yeah, if we can get more farmers in coffee, you know, we could see a lot more um, South African brands, uh, you know, in, in, in the coffee space. But thank you so much for your time, Dylan, and uh, highly appreciate your, your insights this evening. No, thank you so much for the time. And, and all I would just say is uh, when you get the opportunity to taste South African coffee, you'll, You'll also, uh, <laughs> you'll also have the same excitement that I do.
Absolutely. Thank you so much. That was uh, Dylan Cummings, director of Beaver Creek Coffee Estate. And we were speaking um, around the business of coffee, not only farming coffee, but roasting coffee, identifying various markets that one can penetrate within the coffee industry. And as, uh, and as Dylan said, South African coffee is the best coffee and it takes a whole village to make a farm successful, more so coffee farming su successful. Definitely we need more farmers, we need more virtual Vertical integration, support from retailers, wholesalers, industry experts, agronomists. Um, and uh, it's never too late to also learn what other international markets are doing around the coffee industry. How are they getting more yield per hectare? Because at the end of the day, as a farmer, you get your money through your yield because yield times price equals your revenue. So I hope you found this conversation quite interesting. And if you missed our um, talk this evening, you could catch it on our YouTube channel, uh, the private property. YouTube uh, channel and go on to the farming podcast playlist and that's where you'll get this episode which is episode 118 with Dylan Cummings and that's it for me this evening um, I hope you found it quite interesting and please feel free to comment like and share this uh, podcast and I'll see you next time take care